and they'll come probably after they eat. Yep, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Okay, let's uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, heaven, Lord, we thank you for our time together, and I thank you too for uh, for the the many things that you have to teach us and the. Uh, better habits that you want us to have, and Lord, our, our commitment is to, uh, to glorify you, and I pray that you'll uh, uh, open our hearts to change. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so also in, in line with, with diligence that we had last week, um, I forget where I got this quote from, and I, didn't, I wasn't diligent to put it on the quote when I put it in here. Uh, we all have enemies in our own souls that never sleep, whatever we may do. There are no irons on their heels. They never procrastinate. They never say to their master, a little more slumber. Now could you name any hateful enemy entrenched in your own heart, of which you have of yourself said so far, far more than that? And if so, what have you done? What are you at this moment doing to cast that enemy out? And of course, this, the, the, I, the way I see this is that, you know, if we just look at it in terms of the virtues, um, you know, like, well, diligence that we had last, last week, you, you know, there are, there's an enemy in our soul that wants us to not be diligent. And it never, it never rests, inducing us to rest. Or, or, you know, uh, lust, greed, uh, wrath, envy, pride. You know, all those voices are always at work in us. You know, <coughs> be prideful, be envious, etc. And so the idea behind this quote is that, well, we should be counteracting those, those things and, and it not rest in counteracting them. Okay. Uh, uh, you should have the handout for patience, which is this week's virtue. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So just contrasting uh, patience and pride that uh, better better to be patient okay now when you think about patience what word comes to mind ambulances <laughs> <laughs> all right now stop thinking like a fireman uh, okay if I have if I'm to be patient then I must be Waiting. That's right. So that's that's implicit. That okay. Well, I if if I had the thing now, I wouldn't have to be patient. But what we're going to do is expand that definition because it's more than just waiting. It's waiting, waiting, and a willingness to endure suffering. Okay. Because if. If everything was just perfect, then waiting wouldn't be so bad. So there's, there's, you know, the, the virtue of patience is required when you're waiting and as you're suffering. And I will, I will give you an example of that directly. Uh, the expression, the patience of Job, describing the great test of faith Job underwent, in the Bible refers to Job's, to Job's suffering, not merely his endurance. And of course, you know, he endured so much, you know, he suffered so much, you know, the loss of all of his property, the loss of his children, um, the wife was still there to help him through his crisis. <laughs> Maybe not so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and then he's, he's covered with boils, and, and even his friends were not that helpful to him. So, uh, if, you, if you just think about um, Job, 
there's the picture of patience, waiting and suffering. Um, now, as, I've, as we've said before, in the heavenly virtues, the virtue opposes a, a particular vice. Okay, so the vice that we're we're gonna we're gonna use patience to counteract the vice of wrath. Come in, Doc. So, Miss Nancy. Yeah, that's unusual. How are you? So the um, we've been we've been waiting and suffering for y'all to come. Waiting we, and suffering. We we defined we defined patience as not just waiting. This is that season for suffering in a way. Oh, well, that's true. Oh. And we're going to talk about yeah. suffering. Um, so the uh, so the the elements the two elements of patience are waiting and suffering. So. We missed you two, and we were suffering <laughs> until you got here. We weren't just waiting. Obviously, we weren't waiting. <laughs> I thought I was early. <laughs> okay, so um, the uh, but patience is the virtue that helps us with our wrath, with our propensity towards anger, because we all have that. That something happened. And it makes us angry. And the, the, the counter to that is that, well, okay, if you feel that when you feel your stomach churning because something happened that didn't go quite your way, remember what Don said, <laughs> waiting and suffering. So, so there's this, the, 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 the ability to endure the suffering and to wait. Is, is central to uh, the virtue of patience. Um, so if in the face of evil or suffering one simply does not care, no patience is required. So, so this, is, this is one thing to factor into your thinking that, well, I'm going to, um, I'm going to wait and be patient and my solution is just not to care see that's that's not correct either you know to simply not care about the things that are transpiring that's not patience because then you're then you're uh, you're not thinking right if that's your coping mechanism is to just not care okay so that's uh, that's good to remember um, but now, so patience is not in action. Okay, and, and I'll, I'll illustrate that in just a bit, hopefully. So, patience is not passivity, but perseverance. Can somebody pull up James 5.11? Someone have that handy? James uh, 5? James five one. Dot's got it. Go ahead. Oh no, I don't. <laughs> well, no, but you're you're opening your Bible. You. I was looking. We're being. I'm, I'm trying to be patient. He <laughs> <laughs> said, "Five eleven, be more patient." Well, okay, we're having a sword <laughs> drill, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. Doc's ready. Go ahead. Yeah. Doc wins. <laughs> and then we come there less to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job, a sin in the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Okay, so it's, it's, it's the, again, back to the idea of endurance. Okay, and uh, so, um, a person who has true patience is angrily virtuous, whether that means giving time for the emotional heat to subside or before acting or simply waiting for the slow wheels of justice to turn. Now, I think this is a key to the whole thing that, um, you know, you, you give time for the emotional heat to subside. You know, if something happens and your blood pressure spikes, <laughs> sometimes you just 
Chapter 10. <laughs> chapter 10, that's right. Um, and sometimes waiting for the slow wheels of justice to turn. So sometimes, you know, things aren't right here, but, you know, we, we studied justice a while back, and, and what I have really embraced in my own life is that, that God's justice is perfect, okay? God is perfect. Justice is part of his nature. And I, I therefore conclude that, that his justice is perfect. That, you know, things may not go right for me right now, but in the long run, it's going to go right for me. And that's, that's going to be true of, of each individual. And I, I don't know how that, I can't explain how that might work out other than when I, when I embrace that idea, it, it, it helps me be patient and it helps me not be wrathful. Okay? Well, you can't second guess God on his, what he's doing. That's right. That's right. You have to have patience to wait to see what eventuality is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And then possibly you might understand it. <laughs> yeah. And, and right. But, but in the meantime, we just take it on faith. Yeah. You remember the 33 miners? Mm -hmm. In Chile? Chilean? <coughs> Down in Chile? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk quite a bit about them today, and we'll talk about them again next week. Uh, so fundamentally, if you were to read this book, you would you would see all of the virtues come to the surface. Because it was it was the it was these miners and the, and the people above the ground who, who engaged in virtuous behavior collectively and individually that got them through the whole thing. So here's the, here's the review. Uh, on the morning of August 5, 2010, 33 men gathered at the entrance of the San Jose Copper Mine outside Copiapo, Chile for a 12-hour shift. At approximately 11.30, the earth cracked sharply. Two and a half hours later, there was a massive thud, unlike any the men had heard before. A giant section of the mine had collapsed. 33 men scrambled for refuge inside the mine and headed for the safety shelter. A 540-foot square room stocked with enough food and liquid to last a group of 10 men 48 hours. Their nightmare had begun. Above ground, mine and rescue workers searched for signs of life. A slab of rock had sealed the main tunnel of the mine. Later estimates would put it at 700,000 tons, almost twice the weight of the Empire State Building. Even if the 33 men below ground had reached the safety shelter, a question remained, could the rescuers do the same? For the next 17 days, engineers drilled and families prayed with dimming hopes for the men's survival. That's the background. So, how deep was this mine? You're probably, that's probably the first question that comes to your mind, right? Um, they, now, the, Chile is a very mountainous country, so, you know, just come straight up from the Pacific. It's just that narrow strip along the western part of South America. So their refuge was just about at sea level. Where these people were drilling was about 2,300 feet above them. Okay, so there's 23 feet of rock between the rescue effort and the miners. So the, there's a zigzaggy picture here you might be able to see. So it, it was four miles of driving to get down to the bottom of the mine. So it was massive. Okay, so... Um, 
uh, and, and this, this, these were miserable working conditions because it was always dusty. And they were, I think primarily it was, they, they followed grain <coughs> veins of copper, copper ore. So when they would take their lunch break, they could grab a boost of oxygen, you know, because their lungs were all hosed up from, from breathing this dust and stuff. Five minutes sucking oxygen was usually enough to get the men back to work, or at least back to the lunch table, where they shared a rare communal moment in their solitary world. So to get through the workday, they would have to take a dose of oxygen. Okay, so this was not the best of all jobs. Mike Rowe would fit right in there. Dirty job. So, so indeed the, the mine collapsed and so 33 miners gathered down in this place of refuge way down in the mine. So I'll just, I'm just gonna pick a few items uh, through here to, to discuss and hopefully mesh it with the idea of patience. So this is day three. At 6.30 a.m. on day three, the men were awake and ready for prayer. Hernandez was cheerful and promised that God would respond to their prayers. Every day that passed, his sermons and prayers felt like a lifeline, a single feature to grab onto and hold tight. The rescue might or might not be coming close but the miner's faith was helping sustain them. They began to refer to Jesus as the 34th miner. Okay? And so the, this, this theme of, of, uh, of God's involvement in this follows all the way through the story. Okay? So, um, one thing with respect to, um, to the idea of patience, and again, so it's, we said patience is waiting and suffering. Okay, so these people are suffering. Even on a normal work day, they suffer because of the nature of the place that they work. And so now there's been this cave in, and they were, the, the, this dust was so bad that it, it caked their eyes shut. But they couldn't see anywhere because there was no lights and mm -hmm. all the dust down there. So. So they, they, it was, the, the moment of the collapse was bad. But um, they did manage to gather down there and there was all 33 of them. So that's, okay, so if we think, if we put ourselves in the minor spot, okay, we're all here. But up on the surface, the mining company was not all that interested in doing anything. <coughs> So, so the, um, you know, like the family members and stuff started to raise a stink, said, hey, you've got you to do something about this. And they made a, a movie about this. What was it titled The 33, I think? Something like that. I can't remember, but I saw it. Antonio Banderas, right? Yeah, Good News Tomorrow. Yeah. So, uh, but, so... So down in the mine, they know that they're 23 feet below the surface. 23 feet. Uh, they, I've heard it both ways. <laughs> it's a long way. Uh, so, so they know their circumstance is bad. The people on the surface have no communication with these folks at all. So they really don't know anything. So you recall the, the virtue of hope Right, so, so this is where the virtue of hope, you know, would come in to, you know, I must be hopeful that, that, that things will get better, right? So, um, so here's, the, here's another moment from the, uh, uh, from the life of Mario Sepulveda. As the heat drained the water and energy from their bodies, many of the men began looking for God. Mario Sepulveda had a, had a conversation with the devil. I would go to, a, to pray in a place that was very solid, isolated. And again, 
they were in this refuge, but there was also tunnels around them, so they could actually, you know, they weren't they weren't stuck in a little room like this. I would go uh, to pray in a place that was very isolated. In one of those prayers, I was praying very loudly, and a huge rock fell next to me. I knew it was not God, but that it was the devil. He was coming for me. All the hair on my body stood up. Sepulveda began to Sepulveda began to scream at the rock. How much longer will it take you to understand? You too are a son of God. Be humble. After that confrontation, the devil left Sepulveda in peace. So that's just an illustration of, you know, if you can imagine, you're stuck down there in the dark, and you don't know what's going to happen to you. Okay. Now. The one reason that I relate this to patience is that, uh, you know, I've said that patience is waiting and suffering. So they could have just sat there and waited and suffered, right? I mean, that would be, that would kind of fit the definition of waiting and suffering. But they, they were able to do more than that. So there was some, there, there was water available and it was, it was just funky water flowing through the mine uh, and there was a very small amount of food okay but see they they essentially had a duty to keep all of themselves alive right mm -hmm. so there, there was a, there was a, an activity associated with their waiting and suffering and uh, and I, I think I have a a tab here for some of the stuff that they went through. Uh, and here again, instead of calling themselves the 33 men, they started referring to 34. God was with them. He was the 34th minor. Even the non-believers began to pray. So there was a, a bit of evangelism taking place down there. Um, now back to so so here's here's some of the, the sort of thing that they were doing in you know recognizing they had a duty to stay alive in anticipation of a rescue this is day 16 okay so so their past two weeks stuck down in this mine with only two cans of tuna fish remaining, the miners had made another painful decision. Instead of a single bite of food every two days, they stretched the rations to one bite every three days. So they're waiting and they're suffering. Okay, but, but again, there's a certain, there's an activity here of okay, how can we, how can we keep ourselves alive? <clears throat> Which really is their only duty, because they they cannot help themselves. So, um, so that's kind of the picture of uh, what was taking place down there underground. Well, uh, and I was I was off working I think when this took place. So maybe maybe you who are watching the news remember it better but you know the whole this caught the whole world's attention yeah. and you know all sorts of resources showed up down there and there were like three different theories of how best to drill down there and so so the the the, the drill that got to them was the furthest up the mountain so it had the furthest to go and this this guy's drilling and now, you know, let's say that this room is the size of, this refuge is the size of the gym, and you're 2,300 feet above it with a drill bit. How on earth do you find that room? I, I think we could call that a miracle. <laughs> you know, that, that some, providence, mm -hmm. providence or, or, and, and obviously a skillful person was working as well. Um, 
Well, that's right, and, and that, that goes along with last week when I talked about the 10,000 hours of, of, you know, doing something for 10,000 hours takes you to a high level of expertise. So, that's like trying to get a golf ball into a hole on the moon from here to there, you know. Yeah. That's just big beyond yeah. just about anybody. Jose Hernandez, as usual, led the daily prayer. Don Jose lived for Jesus and his daily sermons. What began as a small prayer group had by now turned into a full-fledged evangelical conversion. 20 men regularly went to mass, sometimes more. So, so that, you know, you know, can you, if you're 2,300 feet below the surface of the earth, are you beyond God's reach? No. So no matter no matter where we find ourselves, you know God is present with us, which is another reason to be hopeful and to <coughs> sorry. Um, so um, uh, I'm not sure I have a tab here, but it was I think it was on day 17. Yeah, here we go. With virtually no energy remaining, the miners had long ago abandoned the idea of staying up all night waiting for a drill to arrive. And of course, they hear, they hear the noise of the drill inside this rock mountain. Sleep had never been easy. Humid air, wet ground, and the tense environment had always conspired to prevent a deep sleep. All night domino games served to ease insomnia and combat the terror of starving to death. And they did have some light down. You know, they had machinery that they could start and run the headlights and stuff. I don't think uh, contaminated air was a, a problem. At 5.50 a.m., the sound of a whirring drill, crashing rock, and a grinding noise shattered the calm inside the wet, slippery tunnel. When the drill broke through, it was the most marvelous moment for all of us. We looked at the drill and were stunned. Day 17, remember. It even took us a few moments to understand the importance of what had happened. Only then did we start to hug and celebrate. We then understood the reality. They were going to save us. Then chaos took over. It was crazy. People were running everywhere. I looked for something to hit the tube with. And they managed to, uh, to, to tie a message to the drill. You know, because when they're drilling, obviously it, it you know, dropped or something. And this was, you know, maybe four, five, six in inches in diameter. So uh, so then they, they tied a note on there that all 33 were well, okay? And so that, that went back up, and of course there was all sorts of celebration up there when they realized that all 33 of these people were alive. And there was like a tent city <clears throat> up there where the drilling was, the family members and stuff, <laughs> in anticipation of, of, uh, of this rescue. Uh, so I'm just going to, the, the last item I'm going to take from the book is, uh, so, so the, the, what happened next was, so this, you know, this small mm -hmm. shaft came down and then they could communicate. We could send stuff back and forth because it was going to be another 60 days until they were rescued. So what happened next was, as they were, you know, food, etc., was going back and forth. Then they drilled a second hole to parallel the first, which was big enough for a, a carriage of sorts to move up and down. And that's how they, they pulled these folks out one by one. And it was well orchestrated, so they came out in the middle of the night wearing sunglasses because they'd been in the dark for 69 days. So, you know, there was all sorts of preparation. <clears throat> and that's one of the things that, that we'll talk about next week with the virtue of kindness. Okay. 
So the last item I'm, I'm gonna read is, uh, again, Mario Sepulveda that I mentioned a few minutes ago with a rock falling beside him. Um, I think he was like the second, second person that came up this, this tube. And uh, the president of Chile was there, his name was Piñera. Then Piñera pulled Sebovada aside and asked him to do a brief interview with a TV crew waiting in the wings. Without much option but to obey the president, <laughs> Sebovada sat in front of the camera and described the ex experience as positive. I am very content this happened to me. Now let that soak in for a minute. You know, you've just been stuck in a... In a you know, for 69 days, you've been through this ordeal of, of waiting and suffering, etc. But the first words out of his mouth when he gets to the surface is, I am very content this happened to me. He explains, because it was the moment in which I needed to change my life. Okay, you know, it was, and... You know, someone, I uh, remember someone said once that we change, there's only two reasons that we make a change. One is inspiration and the other is desperation. So obviously, this, these people are in the desperate mode, <laughs> stuck in the bottom of the, that far in the earth. Uh, he continued, I was with God and the devil and they fought over me. You know, and that's, that's our story, right? That's very true. Yes. We're on earth, you know, we're only between hell and heaven. That's where you come to choose. Yeah. Where do you go? Yeah. Right. So, so see, this is, <coughs> you, you know, we have the same story. <coughs> we, we weren't 2,300 feet underground. Uh, okay. The, I was with God and the devil, and they fought over me. God won. I took the best hand, the hand of God, and never did I doubt that God would get me out of the mine. I always knew. You know, what a, what a statement that is, right? Okay. And he, he didn't say it two weeks after the fact. It was, it was at that very moment, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so that's my illustration of waiting and suffering. Okay, so they had to be patient because, and again, remember that the the virtue of patience counteracts wrath or anger. Now they had every reason to be mad at the world, you know, mad at the mine, mad at the company, everything because of their circumstances. But part of part of what sustained them mentally and emotionally was patience, enduring the the. Uh, the waiting and the suffering. Okay, uh, a couple more thoughts. <clears throat> Patience is a virtue only if the cause for which that person suffers is good. You know, we've we've said this over and over again here that that fundamental to any virtuous act or whatever is that the end is good. Okay. And again, um, you know, we all have a common purpose, which is to glor to glorify God and to en and to enjoy Him forever. So, um, patience, you know, patience should contribute to us glorifying God. Okay. Um, we cannot, in the name of patience, ask someone to endure abuse, since the cause of such suffering is evil, not noble. Okay, so, so if a person is, is enduring some type of abuse, and I know that's a very general term, <clears throat> it, it's, it's not our place to say, well, just be patient, if, it's, if, it's, if there's evil in the mix. Okay. You know, like in the case of the miners, that was some serious bad luck. 
sure none of them bought a lottery ticket that day. The patients that called the chair out a bunch of times. I thought about after being relatively open down there, have room to move around. Then they put him in that little bitty capsule and started dragging slowly up 2,600 feet, knowing that if anything breaks, it's over. That's right. Yeah. Or if the, if, the, if, the, if the device got stuck halfway, yeah. it's all over for everybody. Yeah. yeah, it was all, the whole thing was just very tenuous that it would work out. <clears throat> the patient person chooses to bear evil rather than to commit further evil in response to it. So, and you can see where, okay, with, you know, something bad is happening to me, and then to, to respond with anger, you know, is probably the wrong thing to do. That's, that's where we need patience to. Yes, nothing done. Yep. Uh, Aquinas, uh, indeed all virtues, Aquinas says, are directed to the good of the soul. So as, as we engage in patience, as we suffer and wait, <coughs> this is good for the soul. And that's perfectly illustrated in the minors where, you know, he can say that, you know, I'm glad this happened to me, or I'm, I'm content that it happened to me. Um, Luke 21, 19, in your patience, you shall possess your souls. Okay, so, so a, a thing we gain with patience is that we, we, we possess our souls. That is, we, we have, you know, there's harmony within our lives as we do that. Okay, we've got a little time left. Any, any thoughts, any other accounts of patience? I know it's hard to compete with 33 minors. <laughs> yeah, you, you won't top that story. <laughs> I just think about all the, you know, that one guy came up and did the little interview and he said, I'm content with this, that this happened to me and I knew I needed to change. But there were 32 other tales of perseverance and patience and yep. positivity that worked out. And all the people that were involved, how did that spider web out for good? Mm -hmm. And God orchestrated it all. Right, right. So. Yeah, it's 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 quite a tale. Uh, the uh, yeah, of course, you know, we just hit a few highlights, but there's all sorts of details in the book about you know how how it all came to be. And I think in the in the movie there was a lot more focus on the what it took to get to get the wheels in motion to start the yeah. rescue effort because at first it was yeah that was pretty bad down there and so they had to get to start moving but it all you know see it, it did work out that they they were barely alive but they were alive the anxiousness to save lives in other parts of the world doesn't equal it here now it, it may not be as good as now here as it was but there the majority of people just there's no way they're alive so right. nobody is in a hurry yeah yeah uh you know and of course there was some sentiments that well, why bother i mean they they can't be alive can they you know and see how that you know someone could offer up that that train of thought that well how could they be alive well, recovery mission instead of rescue mission. Yeah, yeah. And we got the people that were up there that finally started moving, get something done. It's they watched this whole thing transfer. How what effect it had on them. So it they had to have been affected somehow. Yeah. They might have been mad about the money it cost to get them out, but you know they realized that. Something good came out of one lady. Right. Now, will this just go back to the... Um, uh, the, the virtue of charity. You know, I mean, and so, so on the one hand, you have greed, and on the, on the vice is greed, the virtue is charity. 
So, so this is where, you know, the people above ground, you know, a lot of people engaged in a whole lot of charity to fund this whole operation, you know, to bring in the equipment and the people. And, uh, and again, we'll, we'll see next week, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the sort of effort that was taking place above ground to, to keep these people alive once they had a, once they had the uh, La Paloma, <laughs> the pigeon that went back and forth. Because that, you know, everything had to fit through a, a hole about this big. I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get a really story. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, but I mean, there were so many, so many different aspects of the rescue, so many different parts and pieces and phases. Um, but of course, number one was just to, to, to make a connection and and. Uh, well, and what they gave them for his diet, you know, and not that, too much. That, that's spoiler yeah. alert. That's oh, that's for next that's week. Oh, okay. Yeah. Don't, don't steal my thunder. <laughs> I might get impatient with you. <laughs> okay, well, I know it's hard to top a, a, pati a story of patience like that. But I mean, I, you know, we've all, we've all waited and suffered for something to transpire. So, in, in, in much smaller ways, but not, not insignificant. I think in a small way, we all try to train our kids and our families as they're coming up. And that takes an inordinate amount of patience. <laughs> and then when they finally blossom, everybody sits back and pulls their chest out. Mm -hmm. yeah. what I did. Yeah. You know? <laughs> the, uh, there's, a, there's one little scene in Pilgrim's Progress where there's two little children, you know, kind of toddler age. One is patience and one is impatience. And, and the, he, you know, he draws a contrast between the two and then the, the thought processes that take place. You know. uh, but, but it's, uh, yep. Well, anyway. I think all of us have to, uh, if we've accomplished anything, there's, there's always a certain amount of patience till you get Good enough uh, to accomplish what you want. Mm -hmm. You know, just the learning process as a whole is, you know, just it's just fraught with the idea of giving up. Mm -hmm. It's too hard, and just education in itself uh, to acquire a skill level is 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 difficult. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's why we, you know, really honor people who go above and beyond, mm -hmm. because we all realize the difficulty of, of that second measure in really being an expert at something. Right, and it actually goes hand in hand with, you know, I talked about last week that it takes mm -hmm. 10,000 hours mm -hmm. to, to master a skill, and so, now, obviously, someone who's going to devote ten thousand hours of serious practice. Let's just let's just pick the piano again, since we talked about it last week. Okay, so so obviously, who someone must be really passionate about the piano to to spend that much time in in dedicated practice to develop the skill. So, ten thousand hours of practicing the piano, for example. Uh, there's some enduring, right? And there's probably some suffering because well, I'd rather go, uh, there's a lot of things I'd rather do than this. So, so you, you make the sacrifice of, of other interests you might have dedicated, in this case, practice in the piano. So there's the diligence and the patience uh, meshed together. And again, you know, the, the virtues interrelate. They're not. They're not standalone type things. Well, and we like it in any profession. You know, we always say there's doctors and then there's doctors. Well, we want to have the doctor that graduated top of his class. 
not at the bottom of this class, you know, and we want those that are diligent enough to continue that education and become, I have a certain expertise at what they do. And so no matter, I don't care if you're a carpenter, else, you know, you want an expert carpenter to build your house. Mm -hmm. You don't want someone who doesn't know what a plumb line is. Right. <laughs> you want a straight house, <laughs> not a crooked one. Okay, well that, that pretty well kills the clock. So let's have a word of prayer and uh, move on. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for our time together. And uh, Lord, we, uh, uh, we stand in wonder at the, uh, the ability to endure suffering and to wait uh, displayed by these miners. And Lord, we thank you that uh, even far, far underground that you were present with them and that you sustained them through this period. And uh, Lord, I pray that when... Uh, when we have our propensity to be angry and wrathful that uh, we'll reflect on these miners and, and what they endured and uh, rest in the knowledge that, uh, uh, that our lives are in your hands. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Don, you know, there is a certain amount in this day and time uh, practical teaching that we go through and that we have to contend with bureaucracy. We have to contend with menus, getting through to people to find out about how to fix 